Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Karen Willis. I'm the CEO of the Early Learning Coalition of Orange County, and we are delighted that you're here. Uh, first, the course of business is um, these little things that we'll be talking about today. If you could turn them um, either yeah, to, to uh, right stun on. or something um, so that we oh, don't get mine. interrupted, really that would yeah. be appreciated. So <laughs> I'll do mine later because I don't know how to do it. Um, anyway, um, the, the State of Early Care and Education, this is our fifth one that we are doing, and it really is an opportunity to learn more about an issue of import to the development of young children in our community. And it is also an opportunity for you to show your support for the work of the Early Learning Coalition, but we'll get to that later. Um, annually, we help over 30,000 children find early learning programs that help them get ready for school. And one of those things is the growing skill of technology. Are they able to use technology? Um, that is what we're here to talk about today, and I'm very excited about our panel. And, uh, but to get us started, to welcome us to this fabulous venue, I want to bring up the executive director of the Orlando Repertory Theater, Jean Columbus, to say a few words. Jean? Good morning, and as I like to say, welcome to our happy place. And this very happy place and, and, the, and the set that we're on today is for click, clack, boo, a tricky treat. It's our current production, and probably uh, those folks that you're dealing with, the children, this is their show. This is a wonderful uh, uh, non-scary, uh, the farm animals want to do a surprise Halloween party for Farmer Brown, who gets very scared. And so it gives the young, <laughs> young ones a chance to see what it's like to dress up and have a fun time without having to be scary. Uh, we love the fact that you come and be with us. You're the audience that, that we serve. And, and encourage your folks to come. Uh, this is all parts of part of arts, uh, art, arts and education. This is a place where children come and see productions so that they learn how they fit into the world. And we do that in a fun, entertaining manner. So thank you again for coming and uh, enjoy your whole day. And uh, we also had a special guest that we invited today who was unable to join us, but she has uh, a message to share with us. Please uh, roll the video. Hi, I'm Orange County Mayor Teresa Jacobs. On behalf of Orange County's children and families, I am honored to welcome you to the fifth annual State of Early Care and Education Forum. Every child deserves to learn in a setting that promotes creativity and discovery. But not all children have the same opportunities. Thanks to the work of the Early Learning Coalition, children throughout Orange County can strengthen their literacy skills and boost school readiness. You are literally leveling the playing field for our children. From fun initiatives that promote the joy of reading to early intervention programs, the Early Learning Coalition is preparing our children for academic success. I am so proud to salute the efforts of the Early Learning Coalition of Orange County and to wish you good luck in your work. On behalf of a grateful community, thank you for your investment in our children. Figure that out too. Um, we uh, are very appreciative of the mayor um, offering uh, that, that um, video. It was very special of her to be willing to do that. It is my pleasure at this time to get our program going. And in order to do that, I want to introduce uh, one of my favorite people, a fabulous leader in our community. And just because she happens to be my board chair, um, I've been very blessed to have her leadership on the board. Ladies and gentlemen, Linda <coughs> Lehman Gonzalez. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Good morning. Um, my name, as Karen said, is Linda Lamont Gonzalez, and I am honored to be the chair of the Early Learning Coalition of Orange County. I'd like to start off by thanking any elected officials. I know that. 
The Early Learning Coalition of Orange County works with over 670 childhood provider and 16,000 low income and VPK children each month to ensure that the children of our community enter school ready to learn through high quality early care and education. Quality early learning programs increase children's cognitive and socio-emotional development, increasing their chances of leading healthy, productive lives. I'm talking to the choir and I know that, but you know the difference when a child has these tools when they start school. You know that if they have these tools by the third grade, their percentage of success goes up incredibly. You also know that it's difficult to get them um, on track if we don't give it to them before they get to first grade. This is not just how we feel, it's not just what we see, it's not anecdotal, we know it from data. Data shows us that these formative years from cradle to kindergarten are extraordinarily important in their success. So I thank all of you, all of you for making these children not only have those tools and be successful, but making our community a success also. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for everything you do every day. As you know, none of this happens without sponsors, um, and we have some wonderful sponsors today. We have Lakeshore Learning Materials, which was our exclusive breakfast sponsor, Discovery Kids Putterbugs, Nemours Children's Hospital and its Florida Prevention Initiative and Bright Start Programs, Dexter Education Toys. Our supporters are UPS, Kaplan Early Learning Company, Vicosa, University of Central Florida, Seminole State, FBP Inc. and CenturyLink, and thank you to our in-kind sponsors, Disney, the Orlando Sentinel, and Sir Speedy. Now I'd like to introduce Jennifer Gilbert, who's the VP of Lakeshore Learning Materials, to have say a few words. Good morning, everyone. Um, as she mentioned, I am Jennifer Gilbert with Lakeshore Learning Materials, and I wanted to also introduce Dan Paravano, who many of you work and know as your local representative. Uh, unfortunately, Dan has his jaw wired shut. Uh, so he's asked me to speak on behalf of Lakeshore, and I want to thank the coalition and uh, for allowing us to support um, you as well as the children of Orange County. And for those of you who do not know the Lakeshore story, I wanted very quickly to tell you that Lakeshore is celebrating their 60th anniversary. This company was started 60 years ago by a um, single mom with three children. She took her children from Omaha, Nebraska and moved to Oakland, California and started Lakeshore in the basement of her home. Um, it was run for many, many years by her son and it is now in third generation and run by her grandson. So we are a family owned business. Um, the owner now has five children of his own and uh, so we very much appreciate your support as well. I did want to introduce one other person. Guinevieve is here from our retail store that's right here in Orlando. The company asked me to come in and speak to you today about some of the free services that we provide for the community. Um, every Saturday between 11 and 3, we offer free crafts for kids. Um, in addition, we have uh, regular grassroots events where we invite children and their caregivers to come in and celebrate with us events such as Read for the Record, Dr. Seuss's birthday, and, um, and uh, bunny cakes and all sorts of things. But we also offer a forum for you to come in as educators and facilitators and use our space and our product to further educate your staff members and bring your families in who you serve and give them a chance to work with a lot of our great product and stuff. I appreciate you. And lastly, uh, as you know, you've been registering to win. We wanted to go ahead and let um, from Winter Park Day Nursery, Megan Brown, Megan, you are the winner of the uh, dollhouse, and so if you'll stop back by the booth on the way out, we'll make sure we box that up for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you both. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Maxwell, our moderator, for today's forum. Scott Maxwell is a senior consultant for the Orlando Sentinel. 
In his column, Taking Names, Maxwell covers politics and powerful local peer, people in his insert that runs three times weekly. Maxwell prides himself on providing his readers information that would not be able to get elsewhere. Maxwell has been with the Orlando Sentinel since 1999, began his column in 2002, and is always a voice for the community. Please help me welcome Mr. Maxwell. Uh, early learning issues, and that is something that I Hello. look forward to learning about as a parent of uh, two kids. Uh, the, the question is technology. How much do they need? How much is too much? Uh, I, I think a lot of us know that a, a lot of real life interaction is, is, is important for kids. And in fact, I wanted to give a shout out to Gene. I don't know if he's still here for the rep. Uh, the rep is a great institution in this, or, uh, in this community. If you're not familiar with it, I can tell you as the father of a, a girl who went to middle school, not quite sure where her place in the world was. Uh, this place helped come alive. But today we're going to talk technology, and we've got some people who know a lot more than I do, which is true about most every topic I address. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce them, and then we'll, uh, we'll get right started. Uh, right next to me, we have Wayman Armstrong. Wayman is the founder and president uh, of the Engineering and Computer Simulations, ECS. And with more than 25 years' experience in engineering and technology, Wayman has led the firm in delivering innovative PC-based game technology. Uh, through advanced distributive uh, learning environments. Next, we have uh, Joan Bell uh, in the yellow jacket there. Joan is the, an adjunct professor at the University of Central Florida, child development associate representative and instructor, and an early childhood trainer. She's currently retired, and that's in quote marks. Uh, <laughs> Bell serves as a consultant to the UCF Lab Preschool. Uh, she, she has over 40 years of experience in early childhood and helped write math right. and science curriculum uh, to support many edu educators. Next, we have Dr. Neil Boris. Uh, he is professor at UCF in the Department of Psychiatry and Chief of Behavioral Health at Nemours Children's Hospital, which has a lot of exciting things going on Absolutely. there. Yeah. Uh, with more than 20 years of experience, Dr. Boris focuses on the social and emotional development of mm -hmm. high-risk children. And finally, we have Mariel Milano, who is the Director of uh, Digital Curriculum and Instructional Design for Orange County Public Schools, a position I imagine wasn't there a couple decades ago, uh, and is currently responsible for the development and implementation of the Digital Learning Pilot Program. Milano provides professional learning on an effective use of technology and elementary students, for elementary students. We are going to start, with, though, uh, with uh, you, Wayman. The, the, the overall qu arching question that I think a lot of people want to know, technology for children, how much is too much? I think any technology is too much. You know, I think when LL reached out to me, I work in technology. If you look at your kids and they become teenagers in high school, if they play video games, they're the ones who come to work for us. We build video games for training the warfighter and the first responder. But also in the fact is that I'm a parent married to a uh, speech therapist and former special needs teacher. And when we, we have three kids, 13, 10, and 7, we are Luddites at home. We didn't have cable until just uh, five, six years ago. We looked at the fact, and with a workforce that's highly technology, unless we create those critical thinking skills, unless they understand reading uh, to play, that you know that's something that, that was a, a priority to us. It, it still is that you know our kids don't watch TV during the week. They can't touch an electronic device unless it's school related during the, the week. That, that we look at, at technology as a tool to be used, and it's still as as we look at uh, at kids. I, I work with adult learning theory and how it can be. You know, talk later on how it's used with adults but but technology for us is something we want to minimize and do everything we can and, and we know from everybody here we're going against uh, the culture and trying to go back and to, to say it and it's an ongoing battle and it probably will be into our our, our kids leave but it's uh, something it's a worthy battle and I my hats off to uh, the folks inviting me and what's being done here to, to talk about the topic but uh, you know and I know you're probably shocked from the, the folks who work and I work in technology there's a time and a place and for us it's it's uh, less is more and, and, and I think the first thing you said was any, any is too much. Till what age are we talking about? You know, here? we look at, you know, we started, and I think girls are different than boys. I've got two girls and a boy. Our, my, my son went, 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 could crawl 
when it, to looking for technology and coming back and, uh, and the video games on that. We look at um, that they started probably you know, minimizing TV, but you know they didn't touch an iPad and an iPhone until they were just four or five to look at some minimal games. And again, it, it's something that, okay, we're making a road trip. How do you use that judiciously? What can you go through? But again, be creative. Uh, make up some games. You know, use leg. Do some things outside it. But you've got to, you know, uh, we follow what's called scaffolding learning. And it's the same thing as here. You've got to learn to crawl, walk, and run. This is for where you're, where you're training a combat lifesaver, how to fly a drone or anything else as we teach uh, the young men and women of, of armed services. The same way that's go through there, you've got to minimize that. And, and you're never going to be... Uh, the live experiential learning, and that's what our focus, you know, has been not just as, as a parent, uh, but in, in anything that we've been involved in. Get them experience and don't have them observe. You know, have them be a participant, not a spectator, and so we, okay. we still try to watch that. All right, well, you know you're going to get differing opinions here today. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Bell, all right, oh, here we go. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. Okay, but, excuse me, okay. Ms. Bell, yes. But um, I happen to agree a lot with what he says. Um, your use of technology has to be intentional. You cannot prop a child in front of a, a screen and say, just, I'm babysitting, you know, I'm busy. And it's very difficult with parents these days who work, who come home. And very often, those are babysitting tools. I mean, you look at a hard day's work, if you're driving and you come home and the kid is going, ma, dad, whatever, it's easy to give them an iPad it's easy to give them a game, but what you're losing is that human interaction that our children need. And we're talking about social emotional development. I've seen people take um, iPads and prop it up in front of babies, and the baby is sitting there like, you know, <laughs> what, am, what, is, what is the purpose of this? We have to learn to use it intentionally. We have to learn to use it. It's there. And we're going to have to interact with our children. I totally agree with you and I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think okay. that, yeah. <laughs> uh, I do think that we cannot put our heads in the sand and say, it's, you know, forget about it. Don't show it to them. Don't give it to them. We have to learn to use it wisely. Okay. All right, Dr. Mm -hmm. Boris, I hope you will uh, pull someone's hair or uh, scream. <laughs> yes, I can do that, Scott, okay, without good, a problem. You. That's that's how we roll at Nemours. We yeah. know how to do that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, let me just say, as as a representative from Nemours and UCF, we're really thrilled to be here, and I want to thank the coalition mm -hmm. for putting this together. This is a great topic and a great panel. Um, I'm really going to echo some of the comments, but I'm, I'm maybe twist and look at it from a different view. L, who's one of the organizers here, asked me to talk about brain development. And, you know, what's fascinating to me about babies is how incredibly responsive and creative these little beings are. And I think we've learned over the last three or four decades a lot about that. If you go and look at Andrew Meltzoff, he studies imitation in neonates a few days old. And they can mm -hmm. imitate facial expressions mm -hmm. incredibly. Um, so really, the brain is set up to interact socially. That's, that's how the brain develops. It's literally now, as we understand it, how the pathways in the brain get shaped. So it's really interesting to think about, well, is technology interactive and that was something you guys were both saying put it aside if it's a passive screen exactly. because that's not going to help a kid's brain develop on the other hand if it's interactive and wait a minute I'm a Luddite too I want that to be social face to face whenever mm -hmm. possible mm -hmm. but as Marielle knows if we get to the point where we can use technology in an interactive fashion, that's a game changer. That's something we could think about young children being exposed and, to. And we're talking about one-year-olds, two-year-olds? Well, here's what the American Academy of Pediatrics says. No screen time for under two years of age. Okay. And they say that very, very reasonably because, in fact, we're not there with this interactivity. Mm -hmm. We're just not there. So I'm looking at the potential of technology and time. Now, I'll say I just went away uh, on a trip. I did a training up in Connecticut, 
and I FaceTime my kids, including my two-year-old, in the evenings. I have a two-year-old at home, and let me tell you, that means I'm living the dream. <laughs> and what, I, I can't tell you the joy that each of us got out of that FaceTime yes. interaction. It was, yes. it was wonderful, it was splendid. We had a fantastic conversation using technology. So there's an example, right, Scott, where my two-year-old, I'm breaking all AAP recommendations because he's sitting there with my wife's phone. But again, it's a tool that's allowing that social interaction. Passive, as, as Joan said, putting a baby in front of an iPad and pressing play is, um, I think, frankly, harmful to that baby. Um, on the other hand, as we move toward technology bridging that interactive gap, then we can talk. We can begin the discussion. Okay. All right, That's what you want to add in? You know, our program focuses mostly on um, beginning in kindergarten. So, you know, I come at this from a slightly different perspective, older children. But I think that their needs are somewhat similar. Um, they're still young. They're still developing. I think when you think about what's too much, it's about moderation. Um, in our school settings, we, we take it from a blended approach. We don't have it be passive interaction. I think the biggest misconception about moving to digital curriculum in public schools is that it involves kids sitting in front of computer rows of computers, and they're just getting information all day and consuming mm -hmm. it. And I think to echo all of the points here, is it's really about students finding new ways to communicate, produce, and interact. And that really is an extension of the creative process. I was a kindergarten teacher for many years, and so, in my opinion, I think when you think about what kids can do in dramatic play with technology, what yes. they can do when they're talking and creating, I mean, that's where I think it's powerful in early childhood. But I fully agree that if you're really just sitting there watching long videos, then that's not something that we would consider educationally conducive. Games like Stack the States, I know that's one that's popular with uh, younger kids. It helps them identify geography. My kids sometimes know Wyoming better than I do. Uh, <laughs> say, sort of four-year-old, say. Uh, is a four-year-old appropriate for him to, or her to be working on a game like that you on know, the iPad? I think it's just like anything in moderation, Scott. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to go ahead and look at that time. We know if anybody's been on a long car ride that there's only so much uh, you can uh, yes. do as far as uh, playing along the line. And if you go ahead and find, hey, here's a game, there's something to be interactive, hopefully they'll do it with, with each other. But no, you know, there's so, I think there's a void of not just, as we're talking here, educational games, but ones that are interactive. For sure. Because mm -hmm. I believe what we're doing right now with so much on the iPad is we're creating a, a, a generation of consumers, not creators. Mm. You know, that's exactly. what the iPad is great for. It's for watching. What's, you know, on the YouTube? What am I going to watch? Instead of saying, hey, well, how can I interact? What can I create with? And so I think if you look while, uh, while if your kids are why Minecraft has been so good. It gives you the ability to create. So as long as we're looking at their creating, you know, not just, you know, consuming, I think there's value. Okay, fair enough. Anybody want to... Dr. Boris, you want to add that? No, I, I think that's really what I was saying, and Wayne and I agree with you. It's, it's about the social interaction. If the kid's playing Stack the States and a parent's there creating conversations mm -hmm. off of what's being learned, mm -hmm. Scott, you could learn a lot from your kids about Wyoming. Mm -hmm. You just don't get a hang in You know what I mean? Politics. Right. Yeah. All yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. But again, it's, it's as, as Marielle was saying, it's taking that information and turning it into thinking, creating, conversing. That's where technology can be an aid, not an alone mm -hmm. vehicle. Okay. One study uh, showed that preschoolers spend as much as four hours a day on screen time. And I think it's probably more. No, oh, more, okay. Unfortunately. Um, again, as I said before, we are talking about perhaps looking at the educational settings, if you can monitor that. Mm. But then again, you have to add the home time. So you have to add the cell phones, the iPads that they have on the way to and from uh, school and work or whatever. So I think that is a lot if we have to use them in school. You should not just take them in preschools and put them in a computer center. 
you have to have an interactive thing. You don't put one child, like you said, stacks and stacks of computers. If you're using iPads, you're going to have two or three children interacting with the teacher. And then you, you monitor those times. Moderation, again. Um, I happen to observe, observe parents um, when I've done home visits in the past when it was just television, now we have the computers and everything. The TV is on. You have children, and I think that's something we're gonna talk about a little later, that have their own personal TVs, their own personal iPads, their own personal phones, young children. And I'm talking about much younger than we would like to think, much younger than junior high school children. So I think this time is way too much, and we do have to look at ways of using it wisely. Let's talk about the way to, to monitor that. And I think you just mentioned television. I think you can make the argument that there's nothing, truly nothing new under the sun. Right. And, and some of these were the same when I was growing up. My mother, who was a little prudish sometimes, actually had TV coupons. Uh, and you got like 10 coupons a week and one that was for an hour's worth of TV and you literally had to go drop it in the box and I, every time you wanted to watch Super Friends, there's one of your coupons. What, what, what effective ways, Wayman, we can start with you, would you talk about monitoring uh, how long kids are using technology? Well, that's tough to beat the coupons, Scott, yeah, I gotta was, tell you. Uh, I, like, I like the coupon. <laughs> You know, uh, as I uh, mentioned, you know, we are, uh, during the week, uh, not just not having television, but uh, the electronics. You know, it's, the toughest part for us is uh, our oldest is 13. So much of her schoolwork is done online. Yes. And being able to have exactly. her in a common area of the kitchen, the dining room, uh, the family, where we can see that what she's doing, we go by, and that she's not jumping on and uh, uh, texting. She's got what she also, uh, and the, the kids have a computer they share, so she has what she can do on her homework on her iTouch, which we monitor. And so we won't let uh, electronics go into the bedrooms. Uh, we won't mm -hmm. let them uh, go upstairs. So we have to know, so it's, you know, you're, my wife and I, we get distracted and they're like, all right, w w can you pull up and you see them change? So it, it's tough, you know, and, and culture is telling us, hey, it's okay. And you get, my friends are saying it. And, uh, but it's it just something that, to be vigilant. And um, my wife and I, it's an ongoing battle, probably like, like anybody, but uh, for us, it, it's one that, you know, we can't give in on because you know, we've seen the, the effects with, with friends who, who let their kids and, and with technology and, and where they are. And, the, you know, as you can probably talk in more detail. Some of the antisocial behavior comes yes. later, the, uh, the lack of the emotional IQ on, on connecting later on on that. So when you've seen that effect, you say, hey, I don't want my kids to be that. And you've, you've got to be vigilant. We're going to talk more about the behavioral, but Dr. Morris, do, is there a specific number? People like specifics. You know, yeah. can, can yeah. you say, if I'm letting my kids do X number of hours, that's too much? Sure, I mean, I think the American Academy of Pediatrics has come up with some, some terrific guidelines and they're available online. And interestingly enough, a lot of different groups have come up with guidelines. The idea is under two, no screen time is the correct amount. Is there any, and let me stop you right, yeah. is there anyone here who just disagrees with that? Under two, no screen time? Ariel, you look, you look down. I think, it, I think it goes back to his point about FaceTime. I think it depends on how it's being used. Mm -hmm. There are always exceptions to the rule, right. but I think in an educational setting, like in a, a caregiving setting for infants and yes. toddlers, that I would fully agree. Sounds like agreement on no passive yeah. time. Uh, absolutely, yes. no passive. Okay, all right, and good, that, thank and you. And that piece, back passive, back. is really, really important. Okay. Then as you move up, as kids get older, you begin to change limits. If you try and limit a teenager to under 60 minutes, you're gonna have a battle on your hand, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, heck. You can't limit me at all. That's impossible. <laughs> in fact, I was playing with my kids last evening. We went down to the park to throw a football around, and I did what adults do. I pulled out my iPhone mm -hmm. to answer an email that I really needed to answer. And my two-year-old said to me, Daddy, put it away, mm -hmm. which I thought was a remarkably mm -hmm. astute comment from a two-year-old. <laughs> We're playing, man. Look at this is what we're doing. So I, I think the recommendations are out there on the web. I think they're well researched. I think they're carefully thought through, and I think they make sense. What Wayman's saying is we need parents to be able to set limits. That limit setting for kids is an important duty of a parent. And that limits about electronics is just another thing that kids need to learn from adults. 
And um, I'm, again, I'm pleased we have this forum to talk about that. And, and the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Yeah. Um, and the Fred Rogers Institute put out a great guideline, I think it was yeah. in January 2012. And it, t it tells you about the limits and um, how to use technology wisely. So that's a good document. Do you remember any of the specific? Well, again, the, the two and a half hours of screen time, intentional teaching. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the key caveats mm -hmm. to all this. Mm -hmm. But any time you get over two hours screen time, you're in the red zone for any age. Mm -hmm. OK. And I want to give my mother a good rap here. Uh, aside from the TV coupons, we also had a warm fuzzy jar. And if you did something particularly good, you got to go to the warm fuzzy jar. And sometimes you'd get a Tootsie Roll. Other times you'd get things like a coupon for a hug. Eh, that kind of thing. <laughs> Don't Thanks, knock Mom. it. I used to yeah. do that, Scott. All right. Uh, <laughs> With let, my let's, kids. Let's talk do you have about any of those left, Scott? Any of those Are you looking for a hug? Just <laughs> yeah. Give enough yeah, free today. All right. All right. We'll talk All right, uh, let, let's talk about some of the, uh, the negative impacts uh, of what, and, and maybe, of course, hey, we'll, we'll jump around, but I'll stick with you on this okay. one. What happens? Your brain can change? Yeah, absolutely. And again, uh, brains are organized socially, uh, and so passive uh, screen time literally does not help your brain develop in the least, and it's probably harmful. It's hard to study it in... Um, in rigorous fashion, but we do know that the key indicators of things like speech development and reading capacity, and I have my colleagues from Bright Start here, are really about amount of words kids are spoken to. That's what advances speech development. Technology words don't count. They're not delivered with the hugely important eye contact, facial expression, all those things that engage babies' brains and, again, wire their pathways. Reading to children, interacting, is so much different than a iPad doing Clifford the Big Red Dog. And I love the videos mm -hmm. on the iPad, and I love even some of the story times there. But the data we have suggests that that's not as useful as the interaction you get with a kid on your lap wherein you see them point to something that's not in the narrative and you say oh yeah that's the moon that piece of the puzzle is critically important to kids brain development right, Muriel and then Wayman you want to do you see any of the impacts behaviorally from kids who've got too much technology I think you need to be cautious when you're setting limits in terms of attention span I mean young children have a very short attention span when it comes to technology it should be limited um, when we talk about video use in the classroom we talk about segments that are three minutes or less mm -hmm. um, we talk about making sure that they're stopping and processing what they're learning and that we're teaching students to um, really think about what they're seeing Again, it goes back to the active learning versus the passive learning. Um, one of the things that we see as detrimental is when students learn to be just consumers of, of media. They're just sponging it in, but they're not thinking about it. Our main job is to make sure that kids, when we talk about setting those limits, are learning to monitor internally and think about what they're seeing at any age. Wayne? You know, I would tell you that what uh, my concern is, and, and just, you know, uh, when I have my, uh, my kids have friends over and some of them bring their electronic devices, and so you throw a game on TV and they're watching, and the multitasking, the, the lack of focus on what's going on, mm -hmm. and the social interaction. So it's amazing that you can have a, a group together, but they're not together. And what mm -hmm. used to be a communal experience is now uh, individual and each one sharing it. Yeah. And there's concerns about yeah. that um, afterwards Absolutely. when you finally say, hey, guys, we've got to go. Let's go outside. Let's play. Let's do something else. And how those added it, it, to get the, the focus on, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I want to be plugged in. I'm, I'm in my own world. No, let's go in the real world. And so I think, you know, you'll, anytime you transition from that virtual, you know, that, uh, that screen time into it, especially in a group, there, there's issues with some behavior that come up. And I, I think not just uh, as, as kids, as adults. Yeah. Joan, do you want to add? Well, one of the things that I think I was looking at um, Monster.com and reading what employers are asking um, in interview questions. 
and I shared this with a grandson who is a gamer. And it said that they look for things that you do socially. If you're going into a job where you're going to be interacting with people, they want you to be able to do people things. And so I said to him, he was looking for a part-time job at college, while he was in college, um, you better talk about your volunteer work. You better talk about things that you do with other people. Don't go there and tell them when, in your leisure time that you play games. <laughs> and so, um, and he does a lot. <laughs> but, and Wayman's proud of that. Yeah, uh. yeah. And so, but he called me back after the interview and he said, Grandma, I heard your voice. He said, they asked me, what do I do in my leisure time? And I said, well, I volunteered in the Obama campaign, and I, um, I played basketball. And they said, very impressive, because someone at the time, I think he was about 19, he said, I was just surprised. And I said, you see, we're raising our children to be non-social creatures, because if you have to sit there and you cannot look at me in the eye, um, you know, this is not what we want as human beings. And again, social emotional development. Um, I've seen parents text their children in the house. Yes. Oh, Scott. Scott. I'm being honest about it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mary. Scott. What? I, I'm... Scott, I no, I don't believe sometimes that. Sometimes you're all the way upstairs. Oh, I... <laughs> you know. Oh. How we can use digital learning at all grade levels to create a more personalized experience for students. Um, and so we're running a pilot program. And in that pilot program, we have three elementary schools. And in those schools, um, kindergarten students each receive an iPad. And they have that as a part of their learning through the day. But uh, a couple things I probably should say about that, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what that means. One is that the purpose of the pilot is to really identify the effects on student engagement and student achievement. Um, we know that when we survey our students, even our youngest students who are raising their hands to answer the questions when we ask them, that they want to use technology. And so it's our responsibility as a district to figure out how to best do that in a way that's safe. And the second thing is that we are not moving into a paperless environment. When we talk about using iPads with kindergarten students, um, as a former kindergarten teacher, I think in the back of my mind I get a little bit of the hair on the back of my neck standing up because it makes me worry that people don't see it the way we see it. So we're talking about going from um, what I refer to as paper full to paper purposed, okay? And so basically that means that we use technology with kindergarten students when it's developmentally appropriate and when the technology allows us to do something that we couldn't do with another material. So that doesn't mean we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, we're not getting rid of crayons and paint and blocks. But what we are doing is saying, let's learn another tool that you can use. So when we have our students in a kindergarten classroom, I was just at Weatherby Elementary the other day, they were using iPad minis. So after they had read a big book in whole group time, they were now over with a group and another teacher learning how to use a stylus to record a story and draw a picture about what they had learned. So it was extending their learning. Um, but in another part of the day, they were also using paper and pencil to do a very similar activity. Um, and, and we're looking to run a true research study around this. We have a full program evaluation team working on this to identify the impacts on students and try and figure out the best way with community support to move forward for all of our students. On a serious note, my kids, some of, they sometimes have these uh, online textbooks, yes. and I gotta tell you, they drive yes. me crazy. Uh, you know, sometimes they go looking for something and they know they read it on one previous page. It's difficult sometimes mm -hmm. to, to go back and find those things. Can, uh, you, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about the difference between learning from an actual textbook and a, and a cyber textbook. Well, the, I won't talk about it from a brain reader's perspective, but what I will say is that we find that the user experience for kids is very different, but very mm -hmm. important. 
because we know that as students progress beyond kindergarten and into the older grades, that a lot of the information we get as adults, you now have to read off of a screen somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental way that you read information and get information on a screen is different than mm -hmm. it is in paper. And so the actual idea of literacy at any grade level is not so much changing, but as it is expanding. And having kids be able to understand what concepts of print look like both here and also in a traditional sense. What's that? Well, I'd say in, in many ways, um, e-books, that horse is mm -hmm. out of the barn. You know, at the University of Central Florida College of Medicine, uh, I go up to their library, there are no books, Scott, mm -hmm. or very, very few of them. And that's purposeful. The, the, the medical students are already in a generation in which mm -hmm. what your kids mm -hmm. are doing is what, what they've done. And the fact in, that you can get these materials delivered to a device that you can take anywhere is really pretty phenomenal. What Marielle's doing is critical. If we're going to use technology in learning, again, with kids past preschool, we already talked about the preschool set, and that's really important. We're going to limit the use of technology. But as we get past preschool, we need data to help us understand how can we use these tools mm -hmm. to enhance learning. And I think we're, we're just now getting to that. I, the data is not there. So we're really in a kind of a black box situation, I think. And in the preschool programs, you have to use the real, the real storybooks in conjunction with the e-readers. You just can't present Clifford right to a bunch of three and four year olds, they need to see the book. And then you'll take them in a small group and then they can stretch those figures and highlight them. But then that's, again, intentional learning and that's engaging the children. But you can't just say, okay, we're gonna take an e-reader and I'm gonna have story time. It doesn't work that way. But again, we have to use it wisely. You know, I, I know, echoing here, you know, the, the genie's out of the bottle. Uh, there's a gentleman named Mark Prince who wrote a book called Digital Based Learning. Mm. And not to age the panel here, but except for Mariel, we're all digital tourists. Yeah. But the kids mm -hmm. were talking about digital natives, the, the young workforce yeah. here. Mm -hmm. They'd yeah. want to watch a bad video, they read a good book. What are we doing to reach them? And you uh, were talking not just what's being done on, on uh, e-books, but online as mm -hmm. far as the classes, Florida Virtual, uh, the Khan Academy. Oh, yeah. And giving you an example, uh, there was a dissertation done with one of our, our products we trained combat medics, 18, 19 year olds, and they measured knowledge retention with an instructor in the PowerPoint and then took the instructor out and put a PowerPoint and the video game we developed. 9% increase in the Army, 11% in the Marines, knowledge retention with no instructor. It's only going to keep as we look at that paradigm shifting and changing on how we're going to learn. So, oh, you know, we're, we're trying to, to, to figure what's that base, but there's a point where that technology is going to come. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's done the right way, but it's, it's coming and we just have to adapt. Mm -hmm. And you said the retention increased without the instructor. Absolutely. Yeah. And Technology has changed, uh, and, and I, I presume it's, it's improving. I pres presume that 10 years ago, technology wouldn't have. No, you know, absolutely, and uh, I'll, I'll quote C.S. Lewis. You know, we're, and we're talking with, with adults. Most people don't need to be taught; they need to be reminded. And how you're going ahead and, and using technology, especially, and because knowledge is perishable, with critical thinking skills to remind. And so that's what you know. If you didn't know, you know we are in, in Central Florida, the epicenter for modeling, simulation, and training out, and research mm -hmm. partner UCF. And that's what our focus is: it's taking those skills between you're trained and you're cross-trained, taking things that are perishable, working on critical thinking skills, and helping them as far as grow. But that same thing, we couldn't do that unless the foundation has been laid here by the panel and you in the community. And so technology has to come in, especially at the STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. If we don't get kids engaged in middle exactly. school, 4% mm -hmm. of kids who start high school who want a STEM degree will graduate, 4%. So the, the technology has to come in after we've gone ahead and got them in the reading and developed those skills and start bringing them and letting them in because otherwise we are not going to be competitive, uh, not just locally but our country. I'll tell you too that the technology from an educational perspective is definitely in a different place than it is in the business world. Um, certainly there's a lot more advanced things happening. Our publishers um, have struggled to come along. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons you haven't seen a lot of school districts move forward that quickly is because we want to make sure that we do it right, not right now. 
Um, and so we're waiting to make sure that the products have developed so that they're truly interactive and that they're developmentally appropriate. In previous years, when you talked about digital curriculum, what you were really talking about was digitized content. They took textbooks and they PDF'd them and they put them on iPads and you read the PDF document online and that was digital curriculum. And that didn't provide a benefit to kids. And so when we talk about technology changing in schools, now we have seen a huge advancement. I mean, everything from simulations that teach the most basic concepts to online courses um, to truly interactive ways to communicate across classes, across schools, um, pen pals across nations, and that really wasn't possible three years ago. So um, when you joked at the beginning saying that my job probably wasn't around several decades ago, it really wasn't around three years ago because yeah. the market hadn't exactly. developed to a place where you could really say mm -hmm. we are ready to move you know, an entire generation of students in that direction and we're just now on that cusp. And to be honest with you, I think the market still has room to grow. And I think this is where some parents start to get, because all of a sudden, if you listen to the last five minutes, you get the impression you might be behind. Your kids aren't. And, and so then th th we get back to the original, how early is too early? And I thought I might move that into social media. Mm -hmm. That's uh, one that I know a lot of parents <laughs> wrestle with. One of the things mm -hmm. I've learned, and I tell parents, is if you actually just go look at the terms of use agreements on most of these social medias, Instagram, for instance, will tell you you're not supposed to have kids under 13, 13, 13 on there. And that's not the way it's used. Well, when, when should a kid be allowed to be using social media? I think, again, it goes back to the intentional use versus an entertainment value. If we're talking about social media in education, there are platforms, for example, Edmodo, Edmodo. which we use heavily mm -hmm. in our district, which is basically what I refer to as a walled garden. Okay? It's a safe environment where only OCPS students can engage in collaborative discussion with folks in that network. Now there are places in upper education, certainly not kindergarten, where we would start that, um, where you can have conversation about what you're learning in that environment. But again, that's an educational use for social media. It is absolutely true that the Children's Online Protection um, Act is meant to protect students under the age of 13 from using a lot of other forms of social media. And our district, as well as many others, take valiant efforts to make sure that we protect that and we give parents the ability to um, prevent students from using social media that is not for an educational purpose. Okay. What else about, let, 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 does anybody want to give us some spe specific ages? I, I think uh, Facebook's more for us older fuddy-duddies, Twitter's <laughs> maybe in between. Instagram, for instance, can you give me a number? Anybody want to give a number that you shouldn't be on there until? We uh, uh, gave in our, uh, our oldest, uh, as I said, 13, just started using Instagram. Her uh, technology sent her brother two uh, years behind. Uh, we, it's only done on their, uh, on their eye touch. We, uh, we try to, to monitor and, and see what's being done. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and, uh, you know, and I think the biggest uh, issue for us is where they want to take the picture and not, they want to capture the moment, but they don't want to experience it and trying to use it as a teachable time. So it's something that, you know, and, and as you can imagine, you're looking at other kids and, and parents trying to do the yeah. same thing. And, and it is, um, and I think there's some fun and there's some juvenile stuff that, you know, there are kids in there, but trying to keep yeah. it where there's no one going too far. And, and that's been, you know, our concern watching. My wife does a better job than me, but, and I, it's like, I guess, you know, we were our uh, immature selves doing things. They're doing it differently and just explain mm -hmm. to them. And, and you touch on earlier, Joan, on, on people looking, you know, we explain, you know, you're going to apply for a job in college. They're going to go ahead. And this is with you forever. Mm -hmm. And so that's some of the things that, that uh, uh, trying to, for them to understand and where you want to go to college or the job you get and going back. So. <laughs> no, look, here's, here's 13 is what Instagram says. Okay. I'm right with it. That, those tools are for teenagers. And they can be used by teenagers, but Wayman makes a very important point. Look, if you look at what we call antisocial behavior, one of the strongest predictors through the teen years is parental monitoring. And, and so those tools are to be used by kids 13 and up, but they're to be used by kids 13 and up with parents engaged. Yes. Right? That's what you're talking about. I want to know what my daughter's doing with Instagram not to be up in her grill, but to turn it into a learning experience, okay? <laughs> and to monitor. Decision-making is not teenagers' strongest points, right? No. And we can get into the brain science of that. 
it's very interesting. You look at teen drivers who are driving by themselves versus with others with in others. the car. Mm -hmm. With others in the car, teen drivers have very serious deficits in their capacity to manage the vehicle mm -hmm. um, because they're distracted by the social engagement piece, all right? So teenagers need the same kind of monitoring that younger children do when we're talking about social media. I think it's a fantastic tool. My kids will be using it one day. God bless it. I have to go there. My heart is beating fast even talking about it now. But they're going to go there with my wife and I, especially my wife. One of the best pieces. <laughs> one of the best pieces uh, of advice I ever heard about social media with parents is that it's it has to be more than monitoring. Yeah. It has to be interacting. Yes. If if the only thing you're doing is to pop in and scold, right? They will stop listening to you. You Absolutely. have to, to yes. like their funny pictures and talk with them about mm -hmm. things. To Absolutely. Participate. Uh, participate. You know, yes. you're their friend on Facebook. It's a weird mm -hmm. thing, a parent being a friend, right. but let's go there. You're there engaged with them. And then in that instance, these tools are fantastic. My children are 12 and 14. They are the only kids and their friends yes. that don't have smartphones mm -hmm. because yes. we've just decided our general rule is you can't have internet unless there's an adult around. But they're yeah. kind of geeks in that regard. I mean, yeah. how, how do you balance what you all are saying we should do and, and the books are saying versus what's actually happening out there? It goes back to the monitoring piece when you think about whether or not kids should have access to those things at home. I think it's really a digital literacy issue more than it is a you should give students access or you shouldn't. When you talk about as a parent giving your student that first smartphone, that first laptop, whatever it is for the first time, the first conversation you should be having is what do you need to teach your child? How are you going to participate in the experience? Um, and it's particularly around cyber safety. You made a really good point a minute ago, which I think we didn't talk about enough as a parent, which is that none of us were teenagers with social media, mm -hmm. um, yeah. including me. And I think that it is incredibly important that from the first time your child touches technology until they leave your home, that a constant part of that conversation is an evolving discussion about what it means to be a responsible digital citizen. Um, and that is not something that truthfully even a lot of adults have a firm grasp on because we didn't have to do it. And so what does it mean to be kind? What does it mean to not be in a cyberbullying situation? Those are really important things because when you keep a 12 or 13 year old from having a smartphone, you are also preventing them in some ways from having the exposure to that kind of thing. That's good, right? Mm -hmm. But it also means that there's a the conversation that has to happen about what happens when you do give them access. And because There's, they will get it, they Scott. Will get it. Yeah. Oh, they've got it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's that's the hardest part is really I think as a parent taking on that edu that education role. Mm -hmm. um, it's not only about just saying I'm sorry you can't or I'm sorry you can. There's a huge amount of education that goes into it as a parent. Anybody want to add on to that? Well said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about some guidelines that you all have for uh, for especially preschool age kids. Uh, and, and access to digital technology. I, I think I've heard you all say, well, with parents present, uh, I think I've also heard people generally say it should be in a public place. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Do you have any other sort of guidelines for folks to take away from here? Not in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, again, not that e-reader, that iPad, that smartphone, that computer. Um, and we're talking about preschool classrooms. Then when you have those devices, the adult is involved, there are other children involved. There's that humanness where I'm looking at you, I'm interacting with you. This is where that social emotional is so important. You don't get that sitting in front of a screen. So we need to use these tools that we have, but not just in isolation, not upstairs in the children's bedroom. Um, obesity is a factor there. You, yeah. you, give, um, you give the kids these tools and they have a television in their bedroom, they have a computer, they have whatever it is up there, but they're also snacking. And I know when I look at TV, you know, <laughs> I, I looked at Scandal on the night, not just snacking. So, you know, they're, they're snacking. They're not exercising, they're not doing that. So you have the obesity factor, mm -hmm. you have no social interaction. Um, and, and we need to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. 
And I want to echo that, Scott, that the health effects of screen time, not just the brain effects, but the body effects, are a very important consideration. Again, when you are passively watching a device or even actively interacting with that device, you are rarely moving. Yes. And we have a serious problem with physical activity in kids. It is very strongly linked to obesity, which in and of itself is a very strong predictor of adult health problems. Mm -hmm. So it, this business about limiting screen time is also about replacing that time with things like physical activity. Advertisers are also brilliant, so screens bring into your child's world the world of advertising, and kids yes. get sold unhealthy things, unfortunately. Actually, remarkably well, advertising works brilliantly for young children. Mm -hmm. um, so the obesity issue is a multi-headed problem. It's a problem about amount of time not being active, it's a problem about the advertising kids are exposed to and what that means for their food choices and health choices. It's a big deal. All right, we are about out of time. I just real, uh, realized that. So I'm going to wrap up on one last sort of controversial question that did come in, I think, on the Twitter feed beforehand that it was given. And, and that is the, the simple question of, is screen time habit forming? Can you actually develop, I guess, an addiction uh, to that? Maybe Dr. Mm -hmm. Boris? Yeah. Uh, my two-year-old said in the van yesterday, Daddy, I want to watch movie Brady Bunch. My wife got the lifetime Brady Bunch <laughs> thing for long travel trips. That's the rule in the van, long trips. Yeah. We can watch Brady Bunch. <laughs> Kids are extraordinarily attracted yes. to visual stimuli. Mm -hmm. That's part of that brain development issue. Uh, Habit forming is an interesting thing. We can get into what is an addiction and how do we define it. It's complicated. But I will tell you that kids will prefer to sit in front of screens over many other activities that are yes. more healthy for them. Okay. And so that's all I need to know about the fact that it, we need to be limiting this issue. And I think if we wrap it up, we're here and be involved uh, as a theme yeah. here. I uh, interviewed the, uh, Dr. Lisa Cosgrove, who was the president of the Florida Pediatric Association, and she said, one of the symbols she had, a, she knew she had a trouble was when a, a two-year-old came in with a parent and she asked the uh, parent to turn on the iPad and the parent had to give it to the kid. <laughs> yes. um, by the way, my name is Jamie Pinheiro and I am the regional vice president for sales at CenturyLink and we are a technology company. Um, you know, Scott, you're a tough act to follow. Um, columnist, stand-up comedian, and yes. great moderator. Yes. So great job, yes. by the way. Yes. Um, Um, I mean, I'm up here, and I, I do have a prop somewhere up here, right? Somebody get a prop? Nope. Okay. Well, um, I, okay. Uh, I have an ask, um, and the ask will be for everyone in this audience to consider um, giving in their own shape, way, or form to the Early Learning Coalition. Um, Centrally provides. I've got. Oh, that's one of the props. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, CenturyLink has been a part of the Early Learning Coalition through its participation on the board, myself, and how about now? <laughs> Is that okay? I'll keep my mouth on the mic. Um, CenturyLink has been a part of the Early Learning Coalition through board membership, myself, and through support of the Five Years Gala, which is coming up in June. And today, I'm happy to announce that CenturyLink will commit $1,000 um, to the Early Learning Coalition. Um, and I am aware that some others will be uh, contributing as well. Um, but in your pamphlets, each of you have one of these. Everyone pull them out so they know what they look like. Just want to make sure everyone sees them. And uh, this is a pledge card. Please take a moment to um, look at it. And in this pledge card, you can donate any amount that you want. But yeah. any individual that I'm donates that $25 or more, there goes the prop. There we go. <laughs> Anyone that donates $25 or more will uh, receive this cute bear donated by Disney. And uh, I'm, I'm aware that these bears need a home. So $25 or more. And if you fill them out and return them to... Staff will be picking them up, um, $25 or more, you will receive this. Now, for every dollar that the, uh, we're able to raise, do you know what we match? 
And I, 1567, I wish I had that return in the market, but for every dollar that you contribute, we are able to match it. $15.67. Now, all of that goes to uh, offer more programming, offer children's services to receive high quality early care, um, and overall support what we do at the Early Learning Coalition. Now, are you going to give? Central Link's given a thousand, and I know that I'm committing to fund a child for uh, one year, which here is, what's that amount, by the way? $300. So if you want to fund the child for one year individually, you can do that for $300. Now, um, again, I want to give our panelists, our moderator, a round of applause for, this has been one of the most fun and enjoyable um, 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 sessions that I've been, uh, I've been at. I mean, the, the, the questions that I've seen, uh, the self-promotion that I've seen on, by Mr. Maxwell mm -hmm. have been great. Just, uh, how you can put into actions and uh, um, organizations in the community that you can um, um, reach out to that can um, help the early learning coalition. Thank you. And the last yeah. thing that I need to do is reinforce something that um, our panelists um, said is that um, all this technology is really great, but it doesn't mean much unless there's interaction between caring yes. adults and young children. Absolutely. And we'd like to leave you today with a, uh, a, a short little video to reinforce that. Again, thank you so much. Take a few seconds to watch the rest of the video and then we wish you the, uh, a wonderful day. So every time you talk to and engage with a child, you are literally growing a brain connecting the different parts of the brain, which allows for new ideas, insights, and creative thinking. So each moment of eye contact, each new word exchanged, each time you make a child laugh, you are strengthening these connections.